Yes, it is sharing. Um, thank you very sharing, much. Dr. Bila. Yes, okay. it is. It is. All right. Once again, I would like to just say thank you very much and good evening to everybody um, who is uh, attending this talk this evening. Um, I've already been introduced, so I won't go into that again. We're running slightly behind on time. I'm going to be. Tr I will try to be succinct in what I uh, present. There are. There is a lot to talk about the topic. Um, but before I begin, I would just like to give an acknowledgement to number one, clinics first and foremost. Um, um, I think this is a, a great initiative that you guys are running. I'd also like to thank, thank Professor Adam for giving me the opportunity to come and present this evening. I'd like to also mention Dr. Raymond Setson, who without him, I would never have even been doing high school. I would never have learned the, 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 the procedure. And um, I'd like to thank Melissa Williams, Dr. Melissa Williams as well, who's one of my colleagues in Haifu who assisted me with putting together this presentation. Now, before I begin, um, everybody, the screen, that I'm, the picture image I'm sharing on the screen today, I know you've probably asked yourselves while you look at it, what are you looking at? Now, for those of you that do take time to attend the movies every now and again, what we are looking at is the fictional city of Wakanda. Now, this is a city that was um, featured in one of the highest grossing movies of all time, you know, the, the Avengers um, series. And the reason I'm placing this city here is because it is, an, it is a fictional African city that basically is famed for its technological advancements. Now, while I'm presenting a topic today that is not an African-made technological advancement, I wanted to reiterate the point that the only way we as a country and we as a as a as a as a continent can advance is to number one stay up to date with technological advancements and number two once we are up to date with technological advancements seek to further our own understanding in technology and seek to bring our own advancements to the future of healthcare and just technology in general all right so hi from a quick a quick uh, um, list of what I'm going to be talking about. Part, I've split my talk into four four sections. Number one, I'll give you a bit of an intro, a bit of a, a history about Haiku. Number two, I will then, in part two, I'll talk about you know the actual Haiku process, fibroid treatment, and what we've been doing at Barabona Hospital. Number uh, part three will then be about some of the outcomes that we've had over the, the years in the department, the research, and con and a few controversies that I'll highlight. And then part four um, will open for a Q and A. All right, so with to begin, what is Haifu? Now, this is a question I've been asked multiple times by many people that are doctors, some are not, some are laymen. But I realized that in the past two to three, two years where I've been in the Haifu department, not a lot of people actually know what this Haifu thing is. And as I told Dr. Bila, I will explain for now. So it stands for high intensity focused ultrasound. And in brackets, I've placed ablation of fibroids because that's in generally that's that's actually literally what we are doing. We are ablating or burning the uh, the fibroids using ultrasound technology. Now, contrary to what people might believe, we think it's late technology. However, Haifu actually dates back to the 1940s, where they first postulated that if we could focus our ultrasound waves, that theoretically we could generate heat and therefore ablate tissues. In the 1950s, they started looking at um, using ultrasound to, to, to burn liver, and this was in Chicago in, in, in the United States. Then in around 1980, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, the very first hypo treatment um, happened, and this was a case where we had a, an 18-year-old with osteosarcoma. Now, that is a bone tumor, um, a malignant bone tumor, that was treated primarily with chemotherapy. However, after the chemotherapy, they um, looked at, they did some scans to see if there was still radio uptake in the osteosarcoma, and the radio uptake was still positive. They then used HIFU to actually ablate, and post using HIFU on this osteosarcoma lesion, the, there was complete resolution in this 18-year-old. Then, so then the notion of the biological focal, focal zone came, which is technically the area in which if you focus ultrasound waves into one area of tissue, there will be a change, a denaturation of that tissue on that focal point. And that was called the biological focal zone. When we look at HIFU, um, ultrasound, we have two types. We call we have number one, MRI guided, and number two, sonar, gu sonar image guided versions. Now, what I mean by this is we have 
to first see what we're treating. And there are two ways to see or image what we are treating. And that is number one, by doing an MRI, which has classically been used. And recently, we now have sonar-guided um, HIFU, which, which allows us to actually visualize what we're treating in real time. And these are, this is the new and the current development and the system that we are using at Chris Army Baragwana Hospital. All right, so what are the applications for such a technology? So it has been used to treat benign and malignant solid tumors, but specifically for gynecology, in our gynecological sense, we use it for treating uterine fibroids, but we also can treat adenomyosis. Um, the, the urologists do treat um, prostate cancer overseas. In fact, there's quite a large series of prostate cancer treatments, liver cancer treatments, breast cancer has been treated as well. And it is used for palliation in, in the setting of pan pancreatic cancer patients. I've already highlighted bone cancer and I've explained how it is effective in the treatment of osteosarcomas. And they, they are now looking into uh, the treatment, the application for treating renal cancers. So just to touch on the physiology and how it all works. I'm sure most of us, when we were young, had a chance, or hopefully had a chance, to one day play with a magnifying glass in science class. And what we found was if you do focus the sun's rays using a magnifying glass, you can focus it on a specific point. At that specific point, there is a large amount of heat generated. Most people use it to, to burn papers, some burn leaves, some children chase ants. But it's a commonly known thing that if you focus lights, um, um, the sun's rays using a magnifying glass, whatever is between the magnifying glass and the, and the focal point will not burn. However, what is on the actual focal point will burn because there's a large amount of heat generated. This is completely analogous to what we are dealing with when it comes to high food. Now with high food, the only difference is we're not using the sun's rays, we are actually using ultrasound technology. Now the image on the right that you see, that is a depiction of, of our HIFU system where we have a, a transducer. I just wanted to get a pointer here. Okay. okay, so we've got a transducer which emits the sound waves and it emits them from a concave piezoelectric plate that then sends the sound waves towards our focal point. And at the focal point of convergence, that is exactly where we have treatment and denaturation of the tissues. Now, this liver-shaped organ, we can use that to represent the uterus in our setting. So when we look at um, the diagram I'm showing you now, this is pretty much a diagrammatic representation of a HIFU bed. Now you can see we have what we call an MRI table. Now I did mention that the classically um, was the, the, old, the, the older or more broadly used technology was MRI guided, but it does have certain disadvantages that I'll touch on a bit later. And the newer versions that we use, that we have in our... Uh oh, you're muted, Doc. Apologies, somebody muted me. It said the host muted me, Dr. Bila. So um, I've just unmuted myself, sorry. Um, so I'll, I, I was saying that um, the image that you are seeing before you is just a diagrammatic representation of how the hypo system works. We have the table and we've got the piezoelectric plate that I just showed, um, represented now in the previous diagram or the transducer, which emits the sound waves aiming at a focal point, which is the fibroid with a patient lying prone on the bed. Now, with our ultrasound system, we don't need the rest of the MRI table, and we do avoid certain um, disadvantages of MRI being the fact that, you know, it does cause claustrophobia in certain patients, the loud noise, the issues with metallic um, objects, and the expenses of it. I will move on to the next slide. Having a little bit of a lag. Okay, so this is a HIFU is cut in terms of the ultrasound guided HIFU that we are using is currently only available in 29 countries in the world. Recently, two countries have been added and a year, a year to two ago, there were only 26, 20, um, 27 countries practicing. But what's interesting is that in South Africa, 
our unit at Chris Honey Baraguanap is the only unit with this technology. Um, in Africa, there is um, Egypt and Nigeria has recently acquired, but Egypt had a machine quite a while ago. So if you can see, we are at the front runners of the people who are actually using this technology on our continent. Our specific technology that we're using was developed in 1999 um, in China by Chongming uh, Medical uh, University. Um, I've, I've placed the article, newspaper article on the right here from 2015, which is when Chris Hani Baraguanath was lucky enough to acquire a high machine. Now, from what I've, um, the information I've received, it was a uh, kindly donated by the Chinese government um, in conjunction with our uh, Department of Health and it was launched at Baraguana and since then it has been largely run by Dr. Setson who I've mentioned who recently retired um, um, much not much longer than um, a month and a half ago. So our specific model now just to pause the high food principle of focusing ultrasound waves is possible in multiple ways and with multiple size devices the, the 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 device that you guys see before you being a very large you know bed that can hold patients of different sizes with a huge um, um, desktop system this is just one of the many different um, technologies that they have they do have smaller probes that can be intravaginal probes they have high through probes that can treat facial uh, that can um, do facial treatments but for our setting we need we use this model which is the JC200 which can house a patient lying on the bed and we have the control system which is what you see here on the right this is a, a real life picture of our actual unit so just to show you this is our control system which actually has four components the on the where you see my my laser dot that is our PAC system that actually reports on it, it gives us the MRI images now these are not real time MRI images that are taken right there these are loaded images the patient will have had this MRI one to two to three weeks prior to the treatment we have our real time sonar on these screens on the screens below on the right screen that's actually our sonar machine that we can switch between the actual um, image from the bed or we have a side probe which we can use uh, when the patient is not being treated on a on a stretcher on the top left of the screen this is our database where we actually keep all, all records of treatments treatment times energy is used and below that is the actual control screen that's the absolute the actual control interface where all of the commands for the whole system the whole machine are actually used what you see in the on the on the bottom right corner of the, of the image there, that is a a large. Um, it, it's pretty much our ultrasound and electric um, center, and it, it's also our water system regulator. So that it refriger it, it's a it has a refrigeration system that can cool the water. It also has a heating system that can heat the water because our, this this treatment requires us to be able to control um, um, the the water temperatures. I will touch on why, on, on why we use water uh, as a medium shortly. All right, so just a, a closer look at the water treatment system. So our water temperature control ranges from about 10 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees. We have a high frequency uh, uh, generator that actually generates the ultrasound. That is that button there. These two represent the water. And there is an emergency shutdown switch in case things were to go wrong. Other than that, the treatment is pretty safe, but the emergency shutdown switch is there just in case we need to completely shut down all treatment in case of a malfunction. All right, so let's, we're looking at components of this actual machine. What you see before you is what we call the, the um, combined treatment and, and visualizing um, 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 transducer. On top here, we've got a convex visualizing sonar. Underneath it, around there, we've got the treatment sonar and the piezoelectric plate, which transmits sound waves towards the focal point. Now, I'm going to speak a little bit about basic physiology of ultrasound. When we're sending sound waves into, into tissues, in order for us to, to visualize, we need those sound waves to pass through the tissues and return to the receiving transducer. That is only achieved by 
sending those tissue, the, 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 the ultrasound waves at a high frequency of about three to eight megahertz. Now, when we want to treat, we don't want those, those, um, those sound waves traveling all the way through. We prefer them to get trapped and vibrate in the tissues. And so our therapeutic transducer uses high, can use high energy, but sends the sound waves at a, a slower frequency of 0.8 to 2.4 megahertz. So in actual fact, by slowing down those sound waves, we actually get to treat. Okay, I've been through this. These are, this is our, our four monitors. We use it to document the, into the information of the database. We can actually see what we're doing in real time. And um, we've got the PAC system, which shows us the actual images uh, um, that we took from the MRI. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do we have to use MRIs and then go and use um, ultrasound? So the imaging on MRI for tissue is actually the gold standard for imaging tissue. So in order for us to map the fibroids and to adequately know how many fibroids this patient has, what is the size of the fibroids, what is the type of the fibroids and how vascular and are the fibroids, as in how perfused, how much blood is being transmitted from each fibroid, the MRI system is best for that. And so, even though we're using ultrasound um, guided height, we still need MRI images for us to adequately map and assess a patient for treatment. Then, when we actually treat, we actually look at the patient's um, um, pelvis and the uterus using ultrasound. Now, this is beneficial because the ultrasound actually lets us see the, the, see the fibroid and the wound as we are treating, as opposed to the MRI. With an MRI-guided system, you have to capture an image, and there's a lag time of between 10 to 20 seconds before, before you can actually um, treat. So you're actually treating blind, even though you had a, a sneak peek at, as, at what was happening. Now, that might be problematic. In cases because if patients are breathing deeply there is a certain amount of movement you can get from bowel now in that 10 to 20 seconds you can get bowel slipping into the treatment zone and we do not want such, such things to occur it increases the risks of complications so with the operator console this is basically our operating system and it's got four, uh, four sections this is our Pfizer uh, electric um, transducer control and it's thought of as a six dimensional system. I think of it as an eight dimensional system because there's degrees of rotation as well. But to take you through it, this control here is to basically move this plate, which is in the reservoir, either to the left or to the right. Now, I'm going to quickly backtrack to just orientate you guys again. If we look at this bed over here, this is the reservoir, which is filled with water. A patient lies across, with the, with the patient's head on this side, nearer to where we are sitting as the, as the, as the uh, people operating the system. And the patient lies prone with her abdomen submerged in the water. Now, the reason we use water as a transmission medium is because sound waves actually travel faster through water and are well conducted through water. If you, look at, uh, if you look at submarines and the submarine technology, they use sonar technology and they can communicate for kilometers on kilometers in water. Similarly, whales can do the same. And that is the principle that we are using when we treat like this. So we, so we have to use water. Now, when we use the water, we have to degas the water. So we can't have bubbles in this water system. Otherwise, the bubbles will interfere with the sound waves being transmitted. Okay, I'm going to come back to the, to the control system again now. The reservoir is depicted by this diagram here, and this white here is this white board is the actual bed. Now these controls control the the transducer and move it left, right, towards the foot, towards the head, so that the focal point can aim towards the fibroid and treat the fibroid and and treat it in millimeters of with millimeters of accuracy. So we have a left, right on here. We have towards the foot, towards the head. We have an anterior, posterior. Now an anterior would push this transducer down and, move, and bring the focal point towards the patient who is lying prone towards the patient's anterior. 
So if you think of it in layman's terms, it would bring the focal point from inside the body towards the patient's skin. If you look at the PZ plus and minus, this is for the visual transducer, and that moves it also posterior and anterior, but not the treatment transducer. All right. Then we have the, ro the rotation. This rotates the actual transducer from a 90 degree to, a, to all the way to 180 degree. And that allows us to actually aim and visualize the, the patient's, uh, um, patient's pelvis and the uterus in, in two different planes. We can either go all the way from sagittal to an act to a, to a coronal plane when we're doing the patient. This is, this actually says BR plus, BR minus, and this is for bed rotation. So this is where I add the other two dimensions in that the bed actually can tilt to left and right and allow us to basically um, aim at a fiber depending on, on what angle we need. The second part here is our actual, it says begin there, that's our actual um, treatment control. And we've got either a linear system in which we can map out a line for which the, the, the machine will actually shoot and emit energy and on a linear pathway, or we can use a dot method where we are simply shooting energy at one specific point and we manually move that point. Begin is what actually allows the machine to actually shoot. And then we've got on the right here, this is our, our uh, distances for the linear treatment. On the right, we've got our dose parameter control system. And this basically allows us to tell the machine how much energy to give, number one, as in how much power it should be it should be emitting. And you can see that this picture was taken while I was performing a treatment emitting 350 watts. So I was just coming off a test dose, going up towards the maximum one of the uh, treatment dose of, of 400 watts, which is what we aim for. Um, when we when we look at here, we've got a treat a sonication and a rest period. So when I say sonication, I mean treatment, as in to sonicate, as in to give the ultrasound energy. So I'm going to be using that term from now. So when we say we sonicate for one second, that's the equivalent of giving the patient one second of, of ultrasound energy at that focal point, and then we rest the patient for, for three seconds. All right, so that is to make sure that that point is heating up. However, there's not a high level of energy transmission to the rest of the uterus, which would be dangerous if we overheated the uterus to the adjacent structure. All right, then we've got here a push in, push out. So this is our control for the balloon. I do have a picture of the balloon later in the slide that I will show you. And basically that will control the balloon getting degassed fluid, which would then allow us to, to focus the, the, the rays either more anteriorly or posterior, depending on or if, if the actual machine has reached the limit. All right, now that's the intro to what the hypho machine actually is and how it works. I want to quickly recap on fibroids because there's no point in talking about haiku if you guys actually are not, you know, if we don't know exactly what we're trying to treat. So, and what the problems fibroids actually can present. So fibroids are number one, the most common tumor that occurs in, in women, um, very common in women of reproductive age, and they arise from smooth muscle. Now, when we say muscle, they arise from the muscle of the actual womb. And we know that the womb is actually just one big muscle, which is used to put your baby out. So it arises from that smooth muscle tissue. It also has some fibroblast tissue and a high level of collagen. Now that would explain, because collagen is, is largely found in black people a lot more than, than white people, we find a higher rate of, of, of fibroids in the in series um, in, black, in black women versus white women. All right, so if we look here at at the fact that HIFU occurs in women of reproductive age. That is one of the biggest problems in that you'll find a lot of patients that are young women presenting with this problem of HIFU, uh, of, oh, sorry, in this problem of fibroids need, and, and they want to be treated. But there is a big issue with patients that are very young being treated, number one, with surgical, um, with surgical means, and number two, there are controversies regarding other minimally invasive treatments that I will go through shortly. If we look at the, the different sizes and positions where fibroids can occur, we on the left have a uterus, which just to orientate you, there's the fallopian tubes, there's the ovaries there, and you can see there's fibroid number one, 
fibroid number two, fibroid number three on this uterus, clearly visible, and that could be a fourth fibroid over there. Now, this patient has a couple of fibroids, but if you look at her uterus being on average between being about eight centimeters, eight to 10 centimeters, these fibroids are not, not much bigger than two to three centimeters each. On the other hand, on this diagram, that, on this image that you see here, this is an MFU that has gone pretty much out of hand, and we've got these large fibroids that are pretty much the size of a soccer ball. So fibroids can occur in all sorts of sizes and in different positions. And the largest fibroids I have seen, for example, personally are larger than a, a, a basketball, a, a large overinflated basketball, for example. That So it can definitely make the patient look pregnant, even though she isn't. If you look on the right, this is what I what we call the FIGO system, the FIGO um, classification system for, for fibroids. Now, what that seeks to do is it seeks to just create a, a way of us mapping out where on a uterus the fibroid is. And this allows us to basically recommend different treatments. Now, I know that we're focusing on HIFU in this talk, but for us to appreciate HIFU and its place in the treatment of fibroids, we need to know what the other fibroid treatments are and which fibroids they can treat. If you look at, we've got eight different types of positions where you can get fibroids. And on here, we've got a diagrammatic representation of the uterus. Those are the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the uterus. So if you look at a type one, a type zero fibroid, that's a fibroid that occurs inside the womb. Then we've got inside the actual cavity of the womb. Then we've got a, a, a number one, which occurs where you have less than 50% inside the muscle of the womb and the majority is still within the cavity. We've got a type two, which is, le which is slightly more embedded in the actual muscle of the, of the womb. And then we, and, and we've got a type three, which is completely in the womb, but it's still communicating with the endometrium. So when I say in the womb, I'm talking about the actual myometrium or the muscle of the womb. If we look at the type Four, that is completely intramural, but just touching what we call the serosa or the outer part of the of the uterus. We've got a type five, six, seven, and eight. So if you can look at these type five, not really connected to the inside part of the womb, and the type seven is the exact opposite of a type zero, which is sitting all the way on the inside of the abdomen, but outside of the actual of actual uterus. A type eight is your cervical fibroid. The reason we do this is because not every treatment is, will be suitable for a fibroid based on the fibroid type. Now, this is just, the reason I put this, it's got poor resolution, I won't stay on this slide, is that this is another depiction of what we've just had there, just so that you guys can recognize it if you decide to go and use Dr. Google and have a look if that picture comes up readily. All right, so let's look at the problems that fibroids actually cause. I like to think of it as five problems. Number one, what we call abnormal uterine bleeding, or AUBL. All right, so patients will present saying that their periods are irregular. Either they're having very heavy periods, they're having periods that are coming two to three times per month, but they generally will complain about abnormal bleeding. All right, then we've got pelvic pain. All right, okay, patients will complain classically of what we call dysmenorrhea. They get pain during the periods, but it's not normal pain. This is severe pain. Um, it can be absolutely debilitating, and we have patients sometimes missing work, and it's a serious, serious problem. It can range from mild pain that's chronically constantly there, or it can be severe pain that really makes the patient unable to perform um, their daily activities. We have pressure symptoms, and this largely occurs when the fibroids get quite big. As the fibroid gets very, very large, it starts to put pressure on the surrounding structures. Now, you can easily guess that urinary symptoms would occur if the fibroids are putting pressure onto the bladder. Constipation occurs on posterior fibroids or if the fibroid has pushed the whole uterus posterior and it's putting pressure on the intestine, the sigmoid colon going down towards the rectum. Those patients usually will have constipation. There is also the issue of renal issues in that if you technically, if you have a, a fibroid that's putting pressure on the ureter, which is the pipe coming from the kidney, down towards the bladder, the ureter, uh, yeah, the, the ureter, yeah. It, will, it will basically block the passage of urine and can result in the kidney inflaming or what we call hydronephrosis. 
we have pregnancy issues. Pregnancy issues, chiefly um, patients will come and complain about infertility. Sometimes patients can have miscarriages and poor outcomes in terms of later on they have a preterm labor. We can have patients that have reached near nine months and they go into labor and a fibroid can obstruct the baby actually coming out. So there are multiple pregnancy issues that fibroids can actually cause. All right. Then the last one is aesthetics. Patient comes in, says, I've got a mass growing, it's making me look pregnant. All right, now I've coded these, AUB, LCPP for chronic pelvic pain, kilopascals, pressure symptoms, pregnancy for all of the pregnancy issues put together. Aesthetics, I've coded that AAS, and I want to quickly run through the different treatment options before we now get into how we actually treat with Haiku, and I'll show you a couple of videos. All right, what are the main treatment options? So it's always a, a good idea as a clinician to approach treatment of a patient with the least aggressive treatment that will have the least side effects on a patient and the least invasive treatment. That will get the job done, however. So that balance is quite difficult to strike sometimes, especially in, 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 in cases such as fibroids. Always remember to ask yourself, and I'm speaking to my colleagues here, number one, what issue are we trying to treat in order to have the best outcome for the patient? And I'm saying that because we need to look at the what is the patient presenting with? Because we will not treat all of these issues the same. So we must always ask ourselves, what issue are we trying to treat in order to have the best outcome for the patient? The second thing is we need to ask ourselves, are the patient and the actual treatment options well matched? Which is what we in the high department do every single day when we have a pre-treatment clinic. We ask ourselves, are, is this patient well suited for high school? And I'll be explaining what we think well suited for high school actually is. So this is just a hierarchy, and I credit Dr. Setson for giving me the slide. He's actually giving me a few slides that I've put in here. Um, high fruit is on, I like that we put it going up to the top of the hill because it is the only treatment that is considered non-invasive. All right. Well, I would also, I would, I would argue that certain medical managements are minimally to non-invasive. But this is, in terms of procedures, the only one that is non-invasive. We've got minim we've got laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, embolization, which we consider minimally invasive, but there is a, a certain level of invasion in the patient. And then we've got vaginal and hysterect uh, vaginal hysterectomy, which is invasive, but definitely less invasive than a laparotomy. Now, what does non-invasive mean for you guys? This is just a straight example. Now, if you remember, I showed you guys that we are dealing with largely young women of reproductive age. All right, now, aesthetics is always of concern to young women. And if you've spoken to women, uh, your patients, you'll know that it actually is of concern. We have to balance these things out. It's not just about aesthetics, but it is also about the risk factors of an invasive procedure. The more invasive a procedure is, the higher the uh, severe sequelae for the patient. But I want to give you an example. If you see here the scarring on this patient, this is from an open laparotomy. So if we were to do a myomectomy on a patient and cut her open to take out the fibroids, this is possibly how the patient would heal. The middle picture is a less invasive version of myomectomy, which is our laparoscopic myomectomy, in which we put tiny cameras, one, two, camera there and we put ports that allow us to operate on the patient. All right. With high food, this is number one, the first thing that we get in there. There's no skin incision. All right. With high food, we're bypassing all of the tissues in between and we're going straight to the problem. Again, let's look inside. This on the left is a picture of the wound of the laparoscopic myomectomy. Um, I've been watching a couple of videos on laparoscopic myomectomy, and I have seen some videos where, truth be told, the uterus is sutured a lot, a lot neater than what we're seeing on this image. But you get the concept that a laparoscopic myomectomy does do damage to the actual uterus. Often with a myomectomy, if it's laparoscopic or open, this patient will end up having to have a birth by cesarean section should she fall pregnant, because this confers that this results in damage to the the actual uterus, and with damage to the uterus, 
there's weakening of the uterus, and if she carries a pregnancy, there's a risk of the uterus rupturing and over. With Haifu, we've got this digital image here where perhaps you have nothing, no scarring on the actual uterus, no weakening of the myometrium, and this person can go ahead and have a vaginal delivery should she should she choose to. All right. A quick run through. I'm going to run through so I don't run out of time because I've got quite a few slides. Okay. I'm going to run through a recap on the possible solutions to the fibroids. So number one, patient comes in, she's got fibroids. We ask what the problem are, the problems are. What arsenal do we have to you to, to treat a patient? We've got medical management, which are pills, injections, we've got non-hormonal and hormonal. So in, again, I'm going in list of in order of less invasive to more invasive. We've got analgesics. Bernardo, the GP's choice, paracetamol. We've got NSAs, which is, for example, your brufen. We've got opioids like your tramadol, and these will chiefly treat the patient who's complaining of pain, dysmenorrhea. Now, the nice thing with your NSAs is because they have anticostaglandin properties, they will also assist with reducing abnormal time bleeding. Now, if I was to tell you, this should be your first step in assisting a patient who walks into your room and says, I've got a fibroid. You ask what is the main problem that it's causing and you give the patient analgesics, okay? Prothrombotics, we've got tranexamic acid or cyclocapron, which is the main one we use for patients that have heavy bleeding and this is to stop an acute bleed. All right. Again, now we've got hormonal treatment, which is now a bit more invasive. I often ask some of my patients, if I was to say I'm going to give you panado and brufen, would you choose that? And if I was to say to you, I'm going to give you a hormone, how would you feel? And patients generally will tell you that the word hormone, you're going to give me a hormone, that makes the patient feel a little bit more apprehensive to taking the treatment. So the pill, the combined oral contraceptive, that one is our first line. And it's documented greatly as a first line treatment for fibroids. It will treat abnormal bleeding. It will also treat your chronic pelvic pain. All right, it regulates the cycle. The problem with this, there have been some controversies regarding estrogen because fibroids do display estrogen and progesterone receptors. And the question was, do estrogen receptors actually upgrade the, the do the combined oral contraceptives upgrade the growth of the fibroid? But the, the studies have shown that they actually don't. The mainstay, which we'll probably use when we're using medical hormones would be progesterone therapy. Okay, we've got oral tablets, we've got injectables, and we've got what we call the levonorgestrel IUS, in the trans system or the Mirena, and the implants. But the issue with these is they will not cause shrinkage of the fibroids. And what shrinkage of the fibroid is really what we're trying to achieve when we're dealing with it, when we're using high food. We've got our GnRH analogs, for example, Zolodex, okay? Then we've got agonists and antagonists, which all work in a similar way, resulting in a growth reduction in estrogen, pushing the patient into a pseudo-menopause or a transient menopause. They don't become menopausal um, um, for good, but they become menopausal for some time, and this results in shrinkage. Now, I just wanted you to see how many of the issues our GnRH analogs can treat. Because it causes shrinkage, it can relieve pressure symptoms over time. But the problem with like GnRH analogs is that they are anti-estrogen. They are, they, no, they are no, anti-estrogen no, and that results in no, no, no. We have our, 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 our sperms or our selective progesterone receptor modulators, you have crystal metheprostone. The problem with these are they're very expensive, not available in government, and they are even difficult to get in private, okay? But these would, would result in a similar sort of result. They can cause shrinkage, they will treat abnormal bleeding and your chronic pelvic pain without causing extra damage. Now, our procedures, HIFU. I want you to look at the issues that HIFU can treat. We consider HIFU non-invasive. So the price we're paying for this treatment, the price the patient is paying, isn't a high price. With the potential of treating chronic pelvic pain, abnormal uterine bleeding, Reducing the size, which would thereby reduce pressure symptoms and possibly aesthetic, depending on how big it was, with the benefit of not being detrimental for pregnancy. If you put a patient on any of the previously mentioned medical treatments, that patient can't fall pregnant. So high food would potentially treat the patient, allowing a patient who is desiring fertility to possibly fall pregnant. If we look at UAE, UAE is also considered minimally invasive. And for those that don't know what UAE is, UAE is uterine artery embolization. So what we do in this procedure is 
we insert a catheter and we go to the uterine arteries, which are the two major arteries that supply the uterus. The majority of the blood supply basically block off that blood supply. You might wonder what happens, how can the uterus live on without a blood supply? So it has a small collateral blood supply that comes from up branches of the internal iliacs um, that will innovate, that will um, give um, a, blood, a blood supply to the uterus, however, in a much lower dosage. And because of that, the lower dosage, the active fibroids, which are innervated by smaller branches, won't get a high amount of blood and therefore begin to die. It is a controversy whether or not UAE can be used in young patients. And I will be straight up and I'll tell you that I don't believe UAE for patients who are trying to fall pregnant is optimum, is the optimum treatment. Um, we do have some colleagues who swear by UAE. The opinion would probably be by the people who do UAE um, the most, but um, there have been controversies. I'll touch on that later, but that is the one issue with uterine fibroid embolization. Besides the fact that we also have to gain entry, so it's minimally invasive, but you have to gain entry around the femoral region, which can result in infections in that region. You can have bleeding, you can have um, um, bleeding if you puncture the, the, the vessels and, and they don't, they don't uh, coagulate. We've got our surgeries, which is myomectomy and hysterectomy. So myomectomy, again, we've touched on, laparoscopic or opening. It can treat all of the issues, all right? It can treat all of the issues. However, the issue with myomectomy is the price for pain major surgery and all of the complications of major surgery and all of the, the, the expenses associated with major surgery. Hysterectomy is reserved to patients, obviously, who have just had enough with whatever problem and they feel like they would want to take the wound out. On this note, I know that some of my registrars might be, might be watching or listening in. With hysterectomy, offering a patient a hysterectomy to treat fibroids shouldn't be done as a knee-jerk thing because hysterectomy itself is not without complications. Hysterectomy, also we do know that we might take out the wound. We might take out the fibroids and there won't be a problem. But we need to think of certain sequelae. For example, we've got about 10% of patients post-hysterectomy in the next 20 years might develop prolapse. So these are the things that we need to consider when we're, when we're uh, making our decision for a treatment. All right, so at Barra we basically will, will, we send around this protocol and it's available to anybody who might want it. Um, this is how a patient can be referred for, for HIFU. But our basic criteria is we're ca we generally cap it at around 45 years of age to be eligible. The uterine size, as in the size of the actual uterus, should be around about the belly button or below, around about 18 weeks, okay, 18 to 20 weeks. Uh, we do sometimes consider it case by case, depending on the patient's specific situation. We obviously have to have a confirmation of, of, of fibroids. Um, and we actually, we accept a registrar sonar um, or a higher level. We don't need formal formal sonars. And in any case, I'll, as I always tell the registrars, your sonars should be the paramount sonars. You should be able to, to should be confident enough in your sonars to, to, to actually actually send them for, for, for high proof. Recent valid pap smears, so that we're not trying to treat a patient who has a pre-malignant cervical lesion. And then for those patients who have abnormal bleeding, we would like um, endometrial sampling of some sort, a dead sample or a hysteroscopy with biopsy if, if that's possible. We put the number for the department on this PDF that's stuck around the hospital and circulated to our colleagues. And then they can, they can basically refer the patient through to Baraguana. We run two clinics, a pre-treatment clinic and a post-treatment clinic. And in between, we do treatments on Mondays to Thursday, Monday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. All right, so which patients are appropriate for treatment? All right, so now, now that we know the background of the treatments, we're going to get a patient. Which ones are appropriate? Number one, patients that aren't obese. The reason obesity is a problem is because the abdominal wall is quite thick. And trying to send the sound waves through the abdominal wall results in, number one, a higher risk of burning. Number two, if we have a six centimeter thickness of fiber of, of, of the abdominal wall, it reduces, it increases the distance that the piezoelectric plate can send the actual beam to the focal point. And therefore, if the fibroid is posterior or further away from the actual plate, our actual transducer, we can't reach it. So obesity is an issue with some patients. We have had some patients that have come who have got the issue, they're obese, and 
they have not been able to or cannot get any of the other treatments and we present those patients on weight loss programs. Uterine side, so we've advised them to lose weight and, and hopefully if they can come back, we might be able to assist them. The uterine size, okay, as I've said, 18 to 20 weeks, the patient has to be able, we have to be able to see the fibroid on ultrasound. Now this is one of the things that, one of the points that slightly, um, I wish we could maybe upgrade our system. So our system was donated in 2015. Um, so the resolution on the ultrasound component isn't as nice as the ultrasound that we have this, you know, today. Uh, our, some of our ultrasounds can have an it. I'm sure we'd be able to treat a lot more fibroids. But again, you can't treat what you can't see. So generally we find that if the fibroid is above two centimeters, it'll be visible on ultrasound and we can treat it. Patient must have a normal pap smear, I've touched on that. No intrauterine devices. So if the patient has a Mirena or, an, or, a, or a cup of tea, we have to remove those devices. And the patient should not be pregnant or lactating. All right, so patient needs to also be in good health. We don't want the patient to have a lot of abdominal scars. For example, if a patient has had multiple um, vertical incisions on the womb, the risk of burning is high. And that's because those sound waves will catch in the scar tissue. They're moving at a slow frequency and it will increase the heat in that focal point and the patient can burn on the skin. We must, the patient has to be able to lie prone, as I've shown you guys, for two hours without moving. And the patient has to be able to communicate with us, the treating doctors. We all obviously request the patient to have a, a routine gynecological exam to exclude pregnancy infections at maximal masses. I'll put an asterisk there because certain cysts might become pap smears, uh, cervical dysplasia, and pre-malignant lesions. We will not treat those patients. Okay, so I'm actually, uh, I'm actually going to go. All right. So let's talk about the MRI now. There's a classification system. Now what I'm going into is which fibroids can we actually treat? So there is a classification system for the Panaki classification. And I stand to be correct, but I think this was um, by a, a radiology professor based in Chicago, this system, um, I think Brian Funaki. And he developed a system that basically looks at how the fibroids or how tissue will look on an MRI. When we're when we when we we're looking at proton spinning that will spin differently in fluid, um, in blood versus other tissues. So what we end up getting is we get hypo intense, which means it is darker on the MRI, and hypo intense would also mean there is less blood, so it is less vascular. So the less vascular fibroid, these ones are good and easier to treat. So if you can imagine, because we have blood moving through the fibroid, if we don't have a lot of blood moving through the fibroid, the heat that hits the, the, the fibroid doesn't dissipate. If we have a highly vascular fibroid, when the heat or the ultrasound um, um, waves hit there, all of those, uh, 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 the, 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 the heat will be dissipated by the blood that's actually moving. So it makes sense that a highly vascular fibroid would appear hyper intense and wouldn't be a good candidate for life. Other things that make a fibroid unsuitable would be if it was pedunculated, I've mentioned, sticking out into the uterus, okay? But if the stalk is thick, we would treat that. We wouldn't treat a pedunculated fibroid with a thin stalk for the sake of, if we do do that, we might actually release a, a loose body into the abdomen. And that's why we, that one would probably benefit from a lab scope. Fibroids into the uterine cavity, again, we wouldn't want to treat those because ablating the, in, the innermost part of the uterine cavity would burn the endometrium. And if this patient is desiring fertility, we're technically doing an endometrial ablation. So fibroids in the uterine cavity, we would prefer to treat by Mr. Roscoe. So here's just a, uh, an example of a Funaki type 1, a Funaki type 2, and a Funaki type 3. So... As I was saying, I said it was in terms, it, as, as much as it reports on the vascularity of the actual fibroid, I'm just gonna orientate those that might not know what's going on here. This is an image of a person standing facing the left, and this is the anterior, and this is the patient's buttocks. And this here is the womb. And when we look at the patient's womb, this thing that we see here is the fibroid, all right? And this is the patient's spine, and there you've got the coccyx. 
So here is our fibroid, and you can see that the fibroid is darker than the myometrial tissue, and this makes this a Funaki type 1. This one here, you can see the fibroid. Similarly, you can see the uterus, and this fibroid here is of similar um, of similar um, appearance to the actual myometrium, and this makes it a Funaki type 2. On this image, image C, we've got the fibroid, which is looking quite white on this MRI, and that is hyper intense. It is more intense than the myometrium, and this is a Funaki type 3. This fibroid is also probably highly vascular. All right, so now our process, I've discussed the mapping. So the first thing we do is we map using what we call the T2 um, MRI image. So T2, as I've said, it's the type of MRI that we want. And we get two images, we get a sagittal and an axial plane. So for the guys who want to refer to our unit, please, if you are gonna do the MRI for, for, for us before referring, all we need is sagittal T2 and we need a, uh, an axial T2. We don't need any other um, image modalities from the MRI. Um, to give you an example again here, yeah, we've got, this is actually a treatment that we did one or two days ago. We've got a simple cyst here, uh, quite, quite a large one. And then we've got the fibroid here. The patient was highly symptomatic. And, and this is the transverse. Now, if you get, this is the axial view. And you can see in, in here that there are there is a degenerative appearance within the actual fibroid. This here is another treatment we did in the past um, few days. And this patient has one, two fibroids. So to orientate you, this patient is lying prone, how we do when we treat the patient. Here's the, 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 the spine of the patient. There is the bladder, so fluid appears white, okay? Here we've got the ovary with, a, with one or two cysts, okay? You can see there the follicles on the ovary. And then here we've got our, our, our womb. We've got the endometrium here, so we don't want in young patients. This is a 38-year-old female, as you can see. We want to conserve the endometrium. So in approaching the treatment for this patient, this fibroid can be readily treated from the center there. But when we treat this patient, we would have a curtain of, security here where we do not treat. So we would have about 1.5 centimeters at least where we would not treat this fibroid. We would treat it from about this level below. So we would treat the fibroid, all of this, and try to get this all right. This is just the axial view of the same thing. So you can see that with this patient, the endometrium is lying on the patient's back. Okay, I see we've hit seven o'clock. I'm going to run through um, the rest of the slides. We, it's, there's not too many left. Um, Pre-treatment, um, about three weeks before. Um, then two days before we do a bowel prep, which means we empty the, the bowel. The patient uh, basically takes laxatives for two days. In terms of bladder training, the patient has to learn how to hold their urine. So we generally tell the patient to three weeks before, when you feel like peeing, look at your watch, hold it for 30 minutes. A week before, try to hold it for one hour, two weeks before and the week before try to hold it for two hours because the treatments generally average two to three hours depending on the fibroid size. On the treatment day we will do a skin prep of the patient's abdomen so we want the abdomen shaved number one we want it degassed remember that sound waves do not like air so we want the skin degassed as degassed as possible and what you see that looks like a shower cap a shower um, head on the on the right here this is actually a suction device for degassing the skin. And then we don't want the patient to put oil on. So if the patient has put on body lotion or oil, we'll just remove that with alcohol. And then we catheterize the patient in order to fill the bladder. All right, in terms of the anesthesia, we do this process under conscious sedation. Now this is one of the benefits as well. A patient that undergoes conscious sedation doesn't undergo as much risk as a patient that is given a complete GA, for example. So one of the benefits is that hypo can be done under consultation while the patient is awake. We actually want the patient to awake. And there's an anesthetist who monitors the patient. In China, the actual consultation is done by a trained nurse. But obviously in our setting, we, um, we haven't uh, gotten to the level where we can hand over such a responsibility. But um, maybe in the future. If you look at bladder filling, um, the reason we fill the bladder is because we want to ensure that the medium are, is fluid. So we fill the bladder we artificially with saline, but it's degassed saline, so we make sure there are no bubbles in it as well. 
The patient must be conscious so that they can report wound pain, back pain, leg pain, and if their skin gets hot or is burning. That is the real reason we want the patient conscious and not asleep. Now remember, we're dealing with heat and we're burning the fibroids. If this heat spreads and dissipates towards the back, the patient will complain of back pain. All right. It's also a normal thing for the patient to complain of back pain if we are because the wound, the nerves from the womb are innervated and are innervated by the 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 the, 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 the sorry. They're innervated by the nerves that, that go up into the lower back. And so patients that go into labor, patients that have severe um, wound pain, will commonly complain of back pain. We do get lower back pain complaints while we're treating the patient, especially when we begin ablating the fibroid. As the treatment goes, they complain, usually they complain less. But if the fibroid is in close proximity, we must be conscious of that because you can damage the, the vertebrae and the nerves in the back. Wound pain, is pretty much normal. That's why I've got a double asterisk. We expect that because we're causing ischemia to the fibroid. And with ischemia, the nerves die, the tissue, the cells die, and the patient will have wound pain. And that is the chief reason why we have an anesthetist giving the patient strong analgesia and slightly sedating the patient. Leg pain is a no-no. We do not like leg pain, and leg pain is basically um, dangerous because that would let us know that the heat is reaching either one of the either the left or the right nerve um, nerve plexus, which is dangerous. If you damage those nerves, you can give the patient long-term um, sciatica. You can give the patient foot drop. And then, if the skin is hot, we obviously know that you can give the patient first or second degree burns. Now, with all of these major risk factors being noted that we can damage structures, you also need to bear in mind that we have to be very very careful not to damage the bowel and the bowel must be way away from the treatment and treatment area which is why we do a two-day bowel prep prior to the treatment. okay i've got a little video that i'm going to show you guys here this is called the power test it's how we basically just check that the machine is working properly so we set it at 100 watts we put a protection cap on the machine and what we want and we and we set the focal point at the level at which the at the level of the water so we want the, the actual sound waves to hit at the surface of the water. And if there is enough power being generated, we will get a fountain effect. I'll, I hope that we will have, we'll be able to play it. I'm just going to try and play it. One. Okay, and so you'll see that these sound waves are so strong that they can cause a fountain of water. Now you can imagine the patient is lying on there. We technically can, there are videos where, and I didn't, I wasn't able to source one of those videos, but we can technically even write a pattern in the patient, uh, a pattern using the actual the heat at a specific focal point in the, in the tissue that we are treating. Okay, we, set, we then do what we call the flower pattern test. And here, what we're doing is we've got the, what you're seeing here is the piezoelectric plate. We are shooting the sound waves and we want it to converge at a focal point right here. And what we have here is a diagrammatic representation that we want the focal point to, 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 be, the, to be the place where each, each area that is shooting a, uh, that is converging the sound waves is sending the sound waves in a straight direction to meet at one point. If that happens, you get this image that you just saw there. So you get that pattern, which is a floral pattern, um, and that is what we call the, the focal test, the, 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 the flower test. This is a treatment, a live treatment. I am speaking during the treatment, but I'm just going to quickly orientate you guys. So what you see here is the control interface, and this is a patient with a fibroid with a calcified border. It's quite light. It, it does look better a bit, but the resolution is a little bit better in real, in real time. The bladder would be, is here, and what you see here is actually the bowel, which is way out of our treatment zone. So this here is our treatment zone, and this, we haven't started the treatment yet. So this, this patient is untreated. We've got here a little bit of a calcification of the border of the fibroid, and 
and to just show you what it looks like when we actually start to treat, I want you to look in this area. I hope it's not too light so that you can actually appreciate what we call the grayscale change if you look for. But in real time as we treat, you can follow my arrow that I'm seeing there, you get what we call grayscale change and you can literally see the fibroid beginning to coagulate. And what happens is it becomes white. It goes from being dark to being lighter, to being gray, to being white. And that's what we call grayscale change. So if you can look here, there's grayscale change uh, on, the, on the right. And, and this is with a 200 watt test dose. So I'm using a very, very low test dose. And we were already getting grayscale change. And this was a Funaki type 1 fiber. Okay. This here is an, is an example of, if you look on the left, we have, we have a fibroid that I've just mapped out where these are the treatment points, so we are still adjusting. And once we started to treat, we immediately began to get quite good grayscale change on the inner part of the fibroid. Now to completely treat a fibroid, all we need is to treat about 60% of that fibroid volume, we call it the non-perfused volume, and if you treat about 60% of it, that fibroid should um, regress. So here's just an image of grayscale change, because I wasn't sure that you could appreciate it on that video. So then what happens after that? We basically then follow up the patient, and here's an example of a patient before HIFU. You can see that there's a Funaki type 2, and two weeks post HIFU, you're already getting, it's now becoming less vascular so it's appearing darker and then we have four and a half months and ten months later ten months later we've got we're getting size regression of this fibroid okay now part three i'm just going to quickly tell you guys about what in actual fact how our outcomes have been so with that you just have to also think of our advantages so we treat we do hypo as a day procedure Patients don't get admitted, they don't stay over in hospital, they come in in the morning, get treated, get recovered, and they go home. That avoids the whole issue of hospital bed stay, risks of COVID, and it is non-invasive. It spares the uterus. We've been through most of these, um, I've, I've mentioned most of these issues, but the patient recovers very quickly and returns to work um, within a few days. What are the possible complications? Number one, we can get um, transient complications, uh, pain, which is from the ischemia I've mentioned. You can get it in the back, in the legs, skin toxicity. Um, skin toxicity, we can get burns. We can get bowel injury, bladder injury, endometrial damage, Asherman syndrome, and nerve injury. Now, I know I've listed a whole lot of complications, but these are theoretical complications that can occur. And if you do conduct high food properly and you're diligent and careful with the manner in which you do it, the complication rate is very, very low. Another thing is, HIFU doesn't have any ionizing radiation, okay? We can repeat HIFU treatment. So if a patient hasn't had an adequate response, we can repeat the treatment with the same risks. Um, um, and we can, there is no damage to the ovaries. Um, so there have been questions when we do send that heat, does the heat send, get to the ovaries and damage the ovaries? And we've done tests, uh, there's been research that has looked at what we call the anti-malarian hormone, which is a, a, a biomarker for ovarian reserve. And there is no drop in anti malarian hormone with um, post high treatment. It's cost effective. Now, we might discuss the cost later, but it is cost effective when you look at the overall cost with hospitalization. We have a decreased stay, the equipment needed to perform the procedure versus other high treatments. And we don't need to transfuse the patient because there, there's no risk of bleeding during the, during the procedure. There's no HIV transmission because they're not cutting into the patient, between the patient and the surgeons, the risk is low. And all in all, it's, it's safe with a low risk. So I've put a caveat down here that they, what I'm about, these, these um, statistics that I'm showing you here are from our last audit, which was pre-COVID. So we haven't been able to conduct a proper audit of our department statistics during the COVID pandemic. But pre-COVID, we had treated that we had treated 410 patients and in this series, and and now we are at 500, uh, approaching 600 treatments. Um, the average age was 31 years of age, which we can expect because it's patients are of reproductive age. The average weight was 79. We do tape, uh, we do um, taper that because we obviously exclude 
of these patients that the abdominal wall thickness was on average um, 4.9 millimeters. The main issues that these patients presented with was, was number one, abdominal pain, which was your, your, your dysmenorrhea or severe period pain. Um, they, this, this was after the treatment. A lot of them are during and after the treatment. Um, sciatica or buttock, we consider these two quite normal. The burning sensation of the skin, just under a third of our patients get that, and just over 10% of patients will complain of transient leg pain. Now, our, our um, main issues that the patients were presenting with was period pain, um, abnormal bleeding, which re can result in the anemia of the patient. Some were complaining about pregnancy issues, not being able to fall pregnant. Constipation and urinary frequency was about 37 to 30 and 35% respectively. This diagram here is what we call a symptom severity score. Now this is post-treatment. So we follow up the patients and we do a, uh, an assessment where we ask them the severity of their symptoms before high school. And you can see here that this score has a scale of 60 as the most severe. So it's an arbitrary score that uses 60 as the most severe and zero as, as, as um, no symptoms. Pre high flu patients had severe symptoms. One month later, it's dropping. Three months, by month three, there's an improvement in symptoms. And when we say symptoms, we're talking about all the chief symptoms I was talking about from bleeding to pain to constipation. Six months, we've got more than a 50% drop in, in, in symptom severity. And by 24 months, patients are complaining of mild symptoms, with some patients having complete resolution of their symptoms. So in terms of shrinkage and size, remember that hypo treats, uh, it actually causes shrinkage of the fibroids. We have an average of 31% size shrinkage. And what happens, how we get this date is we measure the fibroids at month one, month three, month six, and one year after treatment. And we take a percentage of, of, of decrease. So here it's all just been lumped up, to be honest. It's a, so it's a crude analysis of what the percentage shrinkage is. But at one month, 31%, um, three, three months, 52% of patients have, have, good, have good shrinkage. And then six months at 61%. And then at 12 months, we have 73% shrinkage. And that's the size, sorry, not the patients, but the size relative to the original size of the fibroid. All right, so when we talk about our major adverse events, what have we had in our department? Remember all of the issues that I listed, of all of those we've had, of all of the 570 cases we've currently treated, we've had two cases of first degree, first degree burns, and these were actually a few years ago, not recent. Um, first degree burns, we, by that we mean blistering, and this results spontaneously in the patient. There's been zero bowel injuries, there's been zero bladder injuries reported, um, the nerve injuries, there have been two cases, all right, which both had spontaneous resolution. We do have a case from last year where a patient was complaining of, of um, slight nerve in the, in, the, in the left leg, but it was preceding the actual high food treatment. We've got rhabdomyolysis, one case of rhabdomyolysis. We then found out that this patient actually had underlying um, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. There was one case of a severe, severe non-resolving anemia in a patient, but interestingly, this patient had actually, um, had actually, the abnormal uterine bleeding had resolved close to the height, the height, and she continued to have a severe anemia. Then we, that prompted us to do a, a medical workup of the patient, and we found that she actually had an undiagnosed lymphoma sadly. Okay, so this brings me towards the end of my talk. General issues that people will want to discuss is number one, should hypo be done? I, and I'm just going to jump straight into it because these are the things we, in our department, we get sonographers rotating through. And these are the things we generally discuss. I mean, the first one is, is hypo a gynecologist's or an interventional radiologist's um, 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 treatment? Controversial. Um, but I would, I, I would easily say that I think us as gynecologists are very are well placed to actually conduct hypo. And this being because of the fact that number one, 
we basically sonar the pelvis every single day and we do multiple sonars every single day of our life. That's my first argument for, for, for that. Um, and then number two, I believe that our approach to treating a patient with, with fibroids shouldn't be based on one single intervention. We have patients that come for high food. We put them on and we do the MRI. And when we're about to treat, we decide, you know what, let's treat the singular fibroid. We will send the second fibroid for a myomectomy. And if that is done by a gynecologist, the, the continuity of care is maintained. So with regards to MRI uh, and ultrasound follow-up, so there's been a couple of questions asked that should we be following patients up as I showed with serial MRIs? And in our department, we don't because we did initially when the hybrid first arrived. But because of the fact that an MRI is actually a resource and in our setting, it's a really valuable resource. So we follow up our patients with ultrasounds. So we measure the patient's uh, fibroids with ultrasounds afterwards. Um, and I think that if we could have good quality ultrasound machines, ultrasound follow up is more than adequate. There's an issue of adjuvant therapy. So this is one of the research things that we're gonna that we are currently um, about to conduct in our department. Where number one, we know that high food can shrink fibroids, and we are having a good reduction rate. What happens if we add um, neoadjuvant or adjuvant uh, treatment, which is add depo provera to the patient while we're giving in three months while we're giving uh, post treatment? What if we add uh, zoladex? Um, to the patient after treatment for a few months after treatment. So that's one of the things, the areas that we're going to be looking at. And then there's the issue of high in the private sector. I think it's inevitable that it will be coming to the private sector at some point in time. Um, I think that, you know, a public private partnership should probably be looked into in that a lot of, I mean, we now treat private patients. We treat patients that travel from Cape Town. We treat patients from, from George. We treat patients from all over South Africa, really, because we are the only center. And we, we do not discriminate against patients. All patients are equal. And we treat patients from private or public, you know, equally. Um, they follow the same process, the same booking process. And once the patient's in the system, we do offer that. But we definitely do will need more machines in the in the in the, in the future for for our um, for our country really. And then there was the there's the common question of the leiomyosarcoma or the fibroid. How do we know that we're not actually just treating a leiomyosarcoma? Well, firstly, um, I have bothered the MRI uh, professors with this, the radiology profs. I often go there and I say, tell me, what are the features of a, of a leiomyosarcoma? We've read, we've read on it as well. It's not easy to, on an MRI, differentiate um, in uh, between certain types of fibroids, like the Funaki 3s versus an LMS. It's not easy. However, we do know that high food treats cancers. So on the off, off chance that it was actually a leiomyosarcoma, the fibroid would probably be ablative, ablating it, would ablate it, and would probably have more benefit than a, the possible risk of, of spreading the leiomyosarcoma. Our current research plans in the department, I've mentioned, number one, we are, we've got a, a protocol, we've got a, a protocol going for adenomyosis treatment outcomes. We are looking at pregnancy outcomes. So just regarding pregnancy outcomes, we um, have had over, over the past, 11 or so during the COVID period, we've had patients coming in spontaneously with pregnancies. And these are patients that have had two, three years of, of attempting to fall pregnant. And the only issue that was identified was the fibroid. Um, now, obviously, we, this isn't robust in terms of evidence. We would have to structure the study properly, which is what we're trying to do. Um, we will have a retrospective analysis of those patients. And we are also planning a prospective trial with one of our infertility um, um, subspecialists, Dr. Mukudwane, where we will, we're going to be looking at um, baseline anti-malaria um, hormone levels, making sure the tubes are patent, and then we'll be looking at the differences pre and post high for treatment in pregnancy rates. Then we will also be looking at using adjuvant therapies and shrinkage rates that come from the different adjuvant therapies, mainly Zolodex in our case, and we'll be hopefully trying to report on that in the next year or so. Which brings me to my conclusion. I'm so sorry, I've probably gone way over time, but like, uh, like I said, this, this topic, I mean, it's a, it's a topic that's, that hasn't really been discussed a lot and I, had, I couldn't um, omit some of the information I, I was talking about. But, from, but in conclusion, basically, I think that if you look at 
from treating a fibroid perspective in our context, Haiku is has a huge place in the future. I think it's a, it's an understatement to say it has a place. I think it has a huge place in that it might pretty much become first line therapy um, um, in the future, and it shouldn't be seen by our, by, as a, a replacement to our current treatments, though, because our current treatments have their place depending on what the patient actually has and what symptoms the patient has and the type of fibroids in the patient's situation. Every treatment that I've mentioned tonight has its place in treating fibroids. But HIFU should be seen more as an addition to the arsenal that we have. So all in all and in short, I think HIFU is a very big much, it is very much part of, a, of the future of treating fibroids. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to, to have addressed you tonight. And that's just our department. We're a small unit. On the left, you see our Dr. Setson, who has left us. And then you see Dr. Williams' sister, Naomi, sister Sylvie, and, and sister Joyce. And that was myself and Dr. Setson, who I'm eternally grateful to, who I consider a good friend and a mentor. And I hope you are watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mpete. It's been a, an exciting, a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, as you say, we've given you enough time because it's something new that we have not discussed. Uh, I mean, something new that is in the, in, in the marketplace in terms of the arsenal that we have for treating a fibroid uh, disease. And um, yeah, we, 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 when you continue speaking, I could say that you are actually answering most of the questions that are on the chat line. So I think uh, there won't be too many questions to, to discuss uh, after this full presentation. Uh, I've got two questions from, from my side. Uh, well, I think you've answered one about uh, the availability of, uh, of HIFU in the, in, the, in the private sector, because I think there are lots of questions, people in Cape Town asking, can we have this? Is there, what about in the private sector in Johannesburg? And the clear it is that we can only have I mean, the, the only place where high free treatment is available is at Chris and the Paraguay Hospital at the, at the moment. And you are the leading light in this uh, particular uh, uh, modality of treatment. And thanks to Dr. Sensen that you, you mentioned. Uh, I think I happened to work with him many years ago in, in, when I was in management and I was at Chris and the uh, we, we thank him for that. Second question that um, perhaps also going forward, we, we could consider you said this is not, it adds on to the arsenal, but bring radiologists, interventionists to discuss about the role of, I mean, obstetricians, gynecologists versus uh, interventionists in terms of treatment of fibroids, which brings me to, you, you mentioned it, a uterine artery embolization. Um, what is that you have against it? And um, is that a place for gynecologists currently, or is it only a domain of uh, radiologists? I've had a, a discussion in the past. I won't tell you what I said to the radiologist about what I thought they should be doing or not be doing in terms of uh, treating fibroids. Uh, I just want to hear from you. No, thank, thank you very much for, for, for that question, Dr. Bila. In fact, um, I had this question even when I was a registrar. Um, in fact, I had traveled to uh, Cape Town and I was discussing with a couple of the, the, um, the consultants there at the time in that I always wondered why uterine artery embolization was not conducted by gynecologists um, at the time um, and why we weren't trained to do it. Um, I've received all sorts of, and I'm going to be blank here and I'll just say it as it is, I've received I, I, I've received many, many opinions. Number one, I've heard people say that the, as, a, as, a, as a treatment, it was stolen from gynecologists, which is preposterous, obviously. I, I don't think that we should be looking at anything like that. It is funny, a funny notion, none, not, none, nonetheless. Um, I've also heard that um, because we do not actually have, you know, deal with, with, with internal catheterization of, of vasculature, the person who is more fitting to do a uterine artery embolization is, in fact, the interventional radiologist. And I do believe that it is their place to actually do such a procedure. My issue arises when we have a separation of functionality between departments in that this is clearly a, a state where there is overlapping. 
Now, the nice thing at Paraguanas is that we have a gynecologist who actually works with our, our, our interventionist in performing UAE, which is what I believe should be the case in almost every um, um, UAE department or fibroid treating department. Being in that, our focus is patient care and the patient should be central, not the procedure or not the actual institute or not the doctor, the patient should be the center or the focus. Now, when we put the patients at the center of the focus, it becomes easier to answer the question, who should be the person overseeing a certain treatment? Now, when it comes to five, to, 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 to HIFU itself, HIFU um, should be um, done, I believe, by the gynecologist because of how technical, number one, it is to understand the differences between the different fibroids, uh, the differences between the patient's actual presentation. In terms of the actual procedure, it can be done. Obviously, an interventionist would be overly qualified to, to just sit and do the haiku, but would technically be turning them from a doctor to just a technician. Whereas with every treatment, you want to be treating a patient as a doctor. Every single clue when you're treating a patient is, is actually integral. The, re the, the research that has come out on UAE has largely looked at UAE in terms of what UAE results are like with fertility. Now, I did go on Cochrane, and I can't say the jury is completely out, but it is definitely leaning towards saying, and I've spoken to a lot of our infertility colleagues, towards saying, if a patient wants to, 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 to conceive, uterine artery embolization is not the main is not the main the, the the best treatment for that patient because it reduces the blood supply to the uterus. I mean, it stands within good logic that if an organ is to function optimally, it needs a good blood supply. Now, if we're to diminish the blood supply of the uterus by over fifty percent, what are the chances that that uterus is going to conceive? Is going to conceive and conceive at a rate that is not decreased. And so the the, the Cochrane review shows different studies. Some studies have shown uh, a huge drop in, in, in uh, reproductive um, outcomes in patients post UAE. Other studies are, are equivocal. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, the myomectomy, we know that myomectomies have good outcomes post myomectomy, but it does carry a high morbidity for the patient. You know? so, when it, so in all in all, I say again that with, we, we shouldn't be looking at it as high food is going to replace UAE, it definitely will not. We've had patients that present that are maybe 40, 45, 46 years of age, are approaching um, 50. So those patients are unlikely to want um, pregnancy. When they are of that age, we look at the fibroid type, we still will consider them. I did see a question saying, why 45? So 45, mainly because we, because above 50, the ins when we get to 50, the incidence of cancer does, or of cancer, cancer, cancerous masses does increase. Uh, we don't expect postmenopausal patients to be having issues with with tumors within the in the in the in the womb. We'd expect because the estrogen goes away, those patients um, don't have that. Um, however, we do look at individualized cases. We wouldn't completely send the patient away if you thought you could motivate for the patient and she's above 45. But in that same notion, what I'm saying is, uh, if you have a patient above 45 who's not going to be looking to fall pregnant, that patient can definitely benefit from a UAE if, if, if we can't do other treatments. We've referred many patients for UAE that we thought it was not the best way, it was not the best treatment for them. Okay, thank you very much. We may have time for only two questions, perhaps, because we, we've overrun our time. Um, after how long post hive you can one attempt to do myomectomy on a patient that has failed uh, a myoma shrinkage from HIFU, uh, does it change the plane of the fibroids? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So again, that is one of the, the I, I didn't mention that on our research point, but we yeah. will be looking into that. So generally, the, you know, after HIFU, you we will want to follow the patient up. As, we, as you saw on my previous slide, we, we start to see shrinkage from as early as three months. So we will observe yeah. that patient for shrinkage for, for Doppler activity and to see if there's still you know, a blood supply to that, to that fibroid. If we see that it's not shrinking, the patient is still symptomatic, we have an option to repeat a treatment. If we don't want to repeat a treatment or the patient elects to say she now wants to go for a, a myomectomy, 
there is no um, there's no recommended waiting period to go ahead and do a myomectomy. It has been reported that after myomectomy, there is some in some patients a loss of planes, a loss of the surgical plane, which can make the myomectomy slightly more difficult. Which also has been reported with um, with which also has been reported with patients who, for example, receive Zolodex. Zolodex in that because it starts to cause a shrinkage of the fibroid. Obviously, the fibroid is degenerating, so that plane, that hard shell that makes it easy to surgically remove the, the fibroid, starts to starts to dis disintegrate or, or to blur. Um, and so, we do think that Haifu would probably make the actual surgical excision of the fibroid a little bit more challenging. But we are not at the stage stage where we know for sure. We are currently developing a protocol to answer that question. Again. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Somebody wants to know, moving away from obstetrics and gynecology, if there's no bleeding, why not use it for prostate enlargement and tumors in the blood and the bones and GIT? Okay, so thank you. That was, um, I, I explained uh, in my second slide to, um, to whoever asked that question that HIFU yeah. is, if you look at the scope, it's treated for, it's actually used overseas for prostate, it's used for liver, it's used for pancreatic tumors, it's used for bone tumors, which then obviously I'm sure we're all thinking, why are we only using it for fibroids? And it's inevitable that this technology needs to expand. And if we are honest with ourselves and we look at the greater good and all of the patients, we definitely need to, 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 to expand this and be able to treat prostate. So our general surgery colleagues need, need to come on board. We need to have our urology colleagues um, coming on board so that we can expand and offer this treatment to other patients. But it definitely can be used for those other modalities. And then, sorry, Dr. Bill, I just want to um, answer two questions here. Um, number okay. one, th there's a question about, um, what is there, have there been uterine ruptures reported after, after HIFU? Um, um, they haven't, well, in the large series that I read, you, you, they, there was definitely not an increased rate of uterine rupture. And there are confounding fact, there were confounding factors in the case of uterine rupture that I did read, but it's widely recognized that HIFU does not increase the risk of uterine rupture. It does not. And then the second question I'm reading here on the screen is about formal consent for HIFU. Is there a delay in fertility? Is there formal consent and is there a delay in fertility post treatment? Okay, so first of all, regarding formal consent, there's formal consent for everything, absolutely everything, especially HIFU. We speak to our patients, uh, and we don't do HIFU without just rediscussing all of the other options that the patient has. We always make sure that the patient is fully informed, knows what the procedure is. And yes, just like with anything in medicine, there has to be formal consent, and it must be fully informed consent. Regarding the delay in fertility post-treatment, we do recommend, um, from our, uh, our international colleagues, it's recommended that post-HIFU, because there's an, uh, uh, an inflammatory reaction, in that degeneration and the resorption of the fibroid, we recommend around about six six months of abstinence from conception. So we generally do tell the patients, which is very important. If you have a patient who who says who comes in and says, and she's 39 years of age, and she wants fibroid treatment for 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 infertility, that patient with me, I've, we literally discussed with the patient and explained that look, we will. This, we have to weigh, you weigh that up versus the other treatments because with this, we will recommend you delay falling pregnant for six months. We don't know what your ovarian reserve is. So that is why, from an infertility perspective, that delay is very integral and the patient's age becomes a big factor. Someone's asked okay. the maximum times to repeat high food. Theoretically, theoretically um, there's, there's no real maximum. However, um, we generally won't repeat more than twice um, in our in our um, department. If we repeat it twice and we're not getting a desired effect, we can send the we'll send the patient for an alternative treatment. But this is provided it's the patient's index presentation, and within with this presentation, the patient is still having symptoms. If you have a patient who was treated three four years ago, comes back, it might be a new fibroid that's formed. We can treat that fibroid. Go away, you come back three, four years later, we can treat that fibroid. So from a technical point of view, there's no maximum times of repeating haiku, as opposed to, if, for example, myomectomy. You do your first surgery, it's okay. Second surgery, 
it's still okay. Third surgery, it starts to get a little bit difficult. And the more surgeries a patient gets, all of us surgeons know that it, it becomes highly, highly risky for the patient and complication rates. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I saw there's a question about maybe, I'm sure it's one of some of your registrars. They want to have access to one, the presentation and also perhaps the, the recording. Just a response. We do record uh, these presentations. I hope you, you saw that with your permission. Uh, it will be available on YouTube so they can have access to that. Those who I hope that everyone knew who, who logged in today, you, you gave us your details so that you can submit your CPD point, apply for CPD points on the HPCSA for, on your behalf. And that we can also send you a, a survey after this presentation, which will come tomorrow morning. And also that uh, then you can get a link, our YouTube link, so that at least you can have access uh, to the whole presentation in the talk. Are you, are you quite okay with sharing this presentation with us so that you can give it back to whoever was uh, uh, connected to this evening, Dr. Gatlin? Oh, no, I'm a man of the people. I'll share the presentation, no problem. You share it with us. Yeah, you can share it with us also. <laughs> okay. No problem. Yeah, I think we've, we've run out of time. We can speak. I think you can talk to us more than two hours. I can see that. I really I can on this topic. So thank you very much again, Dr. Bila. Thank you to the clinics uh, management. Again, thank you to Dr. Um, to Dr. Setson. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you to Professor Adam for the opportunity. And thanks for everybody, to, uh, to everyone for listening. Thank you very much. Now, we, we want to thank you very much for accepting this invitation to come and share your thoughts and your, you know, what you're doing. Great work that you're doing there at Chris and Barra. We, we're thankful to you and also to Prof. Adam, who introduced uh, uh, you to us, and we are grateful to her. As, as you mentioned, a number of colleagues are saying that we they want to thank you for mentioning Dr. Sesson for the good work that she has done at Chris and Barra. And so on behalf of clinics, I just want to thank you for, 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 for being with us this evening. And we hope that when we call you again next time, you won't say no. And uh, we just want to thank all the colleagues who have uh, joined us this evening. Uh, they stayed on until the end of the, 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 the presentation, which shows that uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in this topic. And we, we're quite grateful to you and to all of you who've been joining us at uh, clinics uh, at this, uh, all these times so that we have been doing this weekly webinars. I also want to thank the marketing team from Clinics Health Group. Uh, we, tonight we've got Zuki, who's uh, behind the scenes, making sure that we, we have these presentations and making sure that they send invitations to, to all of you. Thank you, Zuki. I just want to say thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>